All right, welcome back. Our uh, final speaker of the morning session is Ashish Goel. He is a professor of management science and engineering and an affiliate with computer science at uh, Stanford University. Ashish received his PhD in computer science from Stanford in 1999. His research interests lie in the design, of anal design and analysis and applications of algorithms with applications in a variety of uh, domains. His awards include an Alfred P. Sloan Faculty Fellowship, a Terman Faculty Fellowship, NSF Career Award, Rajiv Matwani Mentorship Award, and the SIG Ecom Test of Time Award in 2018. And he was a research fellow and technical advisor for Twitter and currently serves as a technical advisor to Coinbase. Uh, welcome, Ashish. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting uh, me. This is, uh, Urbana is always such like a hospitable uh, home and you guys have worked so hard to create a community. When I talk about multi-asset exchanges, axioms and algorithms, uh, uh, basically these two papers, but I'll also try to sneak in a third one if I get time. <laughs> And so Jeff uh, is actually on the postdoc market. Uh, so following Amin's uh, example, I'm going to put a plug in for Jeff. Okay. So in this talk, uh, there's not going to be that much new algorithmic content. I'm going to focus mostly on the models. I'm going to describe. Uh, I'm going to try to map uh, one of the model, one or two of the models that are happening in the blockchain space to theoretical models. Okay. And so. Uh, and when I say multi-asset exchanges in this talk, I generally mean multi-currency exchanges. So think of these assets as currencies, uh, and you're designing a currency exchange. And of course, uh, the reason these problems are more salient now than, say, 20 years ago or 30 years ago is because of digital currencies, both central bank digital currencies and uh, blockchain-based digital currencies. And this infrastructure needs to be interoperable, needs to be efficiently exchangeable. So you have these multiple currencies with new ones popping up every week, you need to somehow exchange them with each other. Uh, the infrastructure needs to scale. It needs to be auditable, reliable, robust, uh, uh, non-adversarial. So that's sort of the broad motivation for this work. Okay. In terms of the outline, uh, I'm going <coughs> to describe some challenges in existing uh, distributed exchange design. <laughs> Again, uh, from the point of view of currencies, I'm going to describe uh, a system that we have uh, built, uh, mostly uh, Jeff has built, called Speedex, which is a many asset uh, badge exchange. Uh, I'm going to point out the underlying uh, theoretic algorithmic problem that arises in that exchange. Uh, what we have done is mostly software engineering here. We haven't really come up with new algorithmic ideas in Speedex. So I'm going to explain how one could add liquidity pools or constant function market makers, which I'll describe, to these multi-asset badge exchanges. And then time permitting, I'll describe some old work on credit networks that's become newly, newly relevant because of uh, this work on, uh, because of the emergence of digital currencies. Right? So existing exchanges are generally continuous double auctions. Uh, you must have seen them. For example, if you go to the stock market and you want to sell some Tesla stock, uh, you enter your bid for buying or selling. Someone else enters their bid. You have a supply curve and a demand curve, and when they cross, that ends up being your clearing price. If they don't exactly cross, then there's some uh, fudge factor, which is uh, the spread between the buy and the sell prices. And this, this matching keeps happening continuously uh, on a stock exchange. Okay. Uh, similar uh, approaches have been followed uh, for uh, these cryptocurrency exchanges or digital currency exchanges. Okay. But there's sort of, uh, in, in these exchanges, if you have uh, uh, also in, current, uh, also in current, a lot of current currency exchanges, if you want to go from one currency to another, you have to go through a series of pairwise trades. Right? And in the, in, the, in the process, you're taking some risk by holding another currency in the interim. Uh, you're taking exchange risks, you're also, taking, uh, you're also paying a lot more transaction costs, and you have to figure out the right way of routing one currency to another. And this routing is quite non-trivial. Uh, there exists a lot of uh, services on the web now which will help you route money from one currency to another currency and find optimum paths. Uh, especially in the context of cryptocurrencies, this is quite... Uh, undesirable because, again, because the intermediate currencies are not themselves very reliable, There's, they fluctuate wildly, and these uh, transactions are very expensive. So what, what is Speedex? It's our attempt to build a scalable, parallelizable, economically efficient distributed exchange. My student came with the name, and then the, the name is Speedex, and then fitted it back. And so the idea here is, imagine you have like a huge network. Think of it as like some, uh, either a centralized system or a distributed system. Uh, there are multiple parts. One part is there's uh, a block proposal. 
So a block proposal is a bunch of uh, orders come in, okay? And uh, they get aggregated into a block. Okay? So it's going to be a batched exchange as opposed to a continuous exchange. A bunch of orders get aggregated into a block, and then this block gets proposed saying, these are the set of orders that we want to handle in this batch. And if you're doing it on a blockchain, then this block is self uh, of uh, suggested orders, the order book itself, what, what you would call an order book in a bank, itself has to go through a consensus process. So everybody agrees this is the set of orders that we're trying to fulfill in this time step. Okay. And then uh, there has to be, this has to be locked somewhere, right? And then you, you have this order book, you have to decide exactly which orders to match, and that part is the one that I'm going to describe, that's speed x. Okay. So in this part, we already have a well-defined order book. Uh, you might be sort of, you're, you're trying to sell any currency. Into, you, an order book might be, I want to sell uh, 70 euros and I want at least $80 in return. Okay, that's an example of uh, an order in an order book. Okay. So just remember that there could be a lot of strange uh, behavior and a lot of hard, uh, a lot of the hardness of the problem is in just deciding what sort of, what the order book is, uh, especially in a distributed system, and I'm going to ignore that problem. Okay. I'm going to focus primarily on this problem of given the order book, how do you decide which orders to fulfill? Yeah. And once again, the algorithmic ideas here are not really new, but the, the, I think the, the connections and the problems that arise and the, and the things that are important for the distributed system versus algorithmically are interesting. Okay. So uh, uh, how can we trade many assets all in one batch, right? Uh, uh, where any asset is priced, any order can be like between any two assets, there's no reserve currency. And the obvious answer is to model this as an ROW exchange market. Right? For uh, a big chunk of the audience, I probably don't need to say anymore, but I'm going to still describe the ROW exchange market in one slide, just in case people haven't seen it. So what, what you would do is you would compute equilibrium prices P and allocations X, and these prices are in some phantom currency. They're not like in the dollar. Okay? These prices are in some, uh, uh, there's no numerator. You could have like an arbitrary numerator. It doesn't matter. Okay? So for example, uh, uh, suppose I have an order which says sell ten dollars by at least uh, one point two euros per dollar. Uh, it's, uh, the numbers are not realistic. Okay. Um, I, at least not yet, right? So, so U of X is uh, uh, so this is an implied utility. Yeah. What is the input? Can you? I mean, the input is a set of orders. Oh, this is, the, this, is, this is an example of an order. I want to send, send $10 for at least 1.2 euros per dollar. So it is both uh, input currency, output currency. An input currency, an output currency, and an exchange rate. And then lower bound on the exchange rate. Uh, uh, a lower bound on the exchange rate, yes. Yeah, so, so like all things is to be valid. So if my order gets fulfilled, then I must get a price which is what I wanted or better than the one I wanted. You cannot offer me a price which is worse than I wanted. And that corresponds very nicely to this notion of voluntary participation in uh, uh, ROW markets. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Sir. So this is exactly the kind of format for an input. You want to sell $10 for at least this much, uh, at least this exchange rate, right? You want to sell dollars, you want euros in return. I can sell any amount between zero and ten dollars. Cannot sell more than ten, of course. Uh, the and the market must give me at least one point two euros for every dollar that gets sold. Okay. And in an arrow de blue exchange market, you can think of that as this user having this agent having a utility of one point two x euros, which is the number of euros they end up having at the end, right? Plus the number of dollars they end up having at the end. And this one point two comes from the exchange which they specified. And then, uh, they, but they also want to make sure that uh, uh, there are these equilibrium prices which got computed. To get X euros, the user would have to, to sell, uh, uh, to get X euros, you'd have to sell P euros over P dollars times X euros uh, number of dollars. And you're left with X dollars at the end, but you only had 10 at the beginning, so this amount cannot exceed 10. So in an arrow debut exchange market, this would be like, this is your initial endowment, this is your utility function, and then you compute market clearing prices. Okay. For sell orders, it's fairly easy. For buy orders, it's a bit more, uh, the utility function is a bit more complicated. Okay. 
So, in general, this corresponds very nicely to arrow W exchange markets. In these markets, you have uh, M agents uh, uh, trading N assets. Each agent starts with an endowment. Okay? And then the market produces a public set of prices denominated in some monopoly money. It doesn't matter what the money amount is, right? Agents sell their endowments, the entire endowment at these prices. And then they buy the optimum bundle given their utility function. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, and so each, each agent sort of makes this decision to buy the optimum uh, uh, bundle. And you say the market is cleared when uh, uh, there's no surplus or uh, access of any good left at the end, or surplus or deficit of any good left at the end, right? So why do we even want to do this kind of many asset batch trading, right? What was different, what's wrong with having a continuous double auction between selected pairs of currencies. And then if you want to go from one to another, you could go through like a route. Okay. First of all, this gives you, uh, this, does, this disallows risk-free front running. Okay. So what is risk-free front running? Risk-free front running, what happens in these continuous double auctions, especially the way, way they're done in blockchains, is that uh, an order comes in and it has a limit price. Okay. There might be another order which, another limit price, but the spread between the orders might be such that I can make money by matching this order with their limit price and that other order at their limit price. Okay. And so uh, people who are closer to the decision making in blockchains, people who are miners who are actually assembling these blocks, okay. when you do this continuous double auction as opposed to a batch auction, then they can do this risk-free front running by, by, uh, by uh, utilizing the spread between uh, different orders. Uh, but in this case, because you have done a batch, you're trading at the equilibrium price, not the limit price. Right? And therefore, uh, this uh, risk-free front-running activity goes away. Okay? I just want to make sure, like, this is like a very narrow result. This is a very narrow observation. It's not like a broad observation saying all adversarial behavior has gone away. Okay? And I'm going to identify the main source of adversarial behavior that still remains in the system at the end of the, towards the end of the talk. <laughs> There's no routing problem to solve anymore. And that means there's also no internal arbitrage that you can do. Yeah. And arbitrage and front running might seem like the same thing, but they're like a little bit different. Uh, uh, there's no reason to hold intermediate assets because the arrow de Bruyne property will, the, the market clearing prices will make sure that along any cycle, the prices multiply out to one. Yeah. And you can get liquidity between infrequent, infrequently traded asset pairs. So if I want to exchange a Goel coin for uh, 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 like a Bizarro coin, uh, I can do it. As long as there's enough demand for Goel coins in any currency and enough for Bizarro coin in any currency, there doesn't have to be a liquid market between these two assets themselves. Okay. Yeah? There's a batch and there are many assets in the same batch. And then the price in that batch is fixed. It's fixed, yes. So it's kind of a linear arrow to prove, yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, so, uh, why, why, and so again, uh, continuing sort of this, uh, because of this fact that these things are in a batch, it means this uh, trading logic is unaffected by uh, the ordering of the trades. Trades in one block commute with another, one another, and it's obvious in a, in a batch set, it's obvious in algorithm, from an algorithm, algorithmic point of view. But for the systems designers, this is, a big, uh, uh, this is a big advantage. Because once you have computed the prices, the trades commute with each other. Once you have commuted prices, you can immediately figure out what trade happens and what doesn't happen. You, have do, you don't have to do them in any order. That means that you can parallelize them. And executing them in parallel and writing them to disk in parallel and uh, assembling the block in parallel ends up being like a big uh, uh, computation advantage. So the core challenge here is, of course, uh, equilibrium computation, the core algorithmic challenge. Okay? And uh, generally, uh, to give you some idea of the, number, of the numbers that we are typically looking at, typically the number of assets is small, like 100 assets that are being traded. And you might have like 100,000 offers or a million offers or like a 10 million offers. Okay. We're going to focus on sell offers. Okay. This problem becomes PPAD complete with sell offers and buy offers. So as long as you have sell offers, uh, it's, uh, it's easy, theoretically easy. If you have buy offers and sell offers, it becomes PPAD complete. I'm not going to go into details of why it becomes PPAD complete. Okay. Uh, but also for this particular problem, there's no good motivation to have both sell and buy offers. The reason you have both sell and buy offers is because of the reserve currency. You're selling Tesla and you need to buy Tesla. Okay. If you don't have the notion for a reserve currency and you can sell, you can essentially have orders from anything to anything, 
then selling A for B is the same as buying B for A. So as long as you have orders in one side, that's enough. And so that's sort of like one design restriction in the system that you, we only have uh, cell offers. Okay? Maybe by the fact that the problem is computationally hard otherwise. Equilibrium, I should have mentioned, always exists. Okay? Whether you have cell offers or buy offers, these are like very simple linear utilities. There's some uh, buy offers give a little bit of concavity, but still uh, all uh, exists is always there, right? For cell offers, there's an explicit convex program, which I'm going to list uh, by Devanur, uh, Garg, and Vig uh, in 2016. Uh, but it's not tractable in practice with existing solvers. So we tried running existing solvers on this convex program, and they croak at like uh, 50 offers. Okay. Um, there's an iterative method which is tractable in practice or can be made tractable in practice with a lot of work. And this is one example. When we started thinking of this, it never occurred to me that this problem would actually be hard in practice. They said, like, uh, it's going to be a convex. I, I mean, it was already clear it was going to be some convex program. It's some like Arrow de Bru market. And so, uh, and then we found the convex program, thanks to Jalal. And uh, there's so much work in, uh, uh, in this community. In fact, like several people here uh, uh, have done pioneering work here. So I didn't think it would be like a hard problem in reality. It was actually, a, none of these things, techniques actually scale. And these are not huge numbers. Uh, so for someone who's interested in doing like algorithms which are not like, uh, which can actually be applied in practice, this might be a good direction. So iterative methods uh, like tetonment actually end up being tractable in practice. Um, what did I do? Okay. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I deleted something here that I should not have. Yeah, go ahead, please. You see, iterative method, you try iterative method for the convex program, yeah. and you can uh, try tetonment, right? So tetonment is an iterative method for the convex program. Uh, is uh, primal dual. So you sort of uh, do what we, I mean, everything is gradient descent in some form. I'm sure there's a theorem that says that primal dual and gradient is in the same. What we do is basically, I had a slide here explaining a little bit more of what tetonment does. And there's something that we do in tetonment that I, I, I'm sorry, I deleted this slide by mistake. Yes, I did delete it. I'll explain what we do in a second. So tetonment itself also, by itself also doesn't quite work. The number of iterations of tetonment are not that hard. What tetonment does, uh, since I deleted my slide is you, Assume some prices, it doesn't even matter what prices. Okay? Uh, each agent or each offer, we are thinking of each offer as being an agent here with its own utility. Each agent essentially has a demand function. So you compute the demand, you know that at this price, how much, what would this agent do? And then you compute the access and the deficit of each uh, uh, asset, and you adjust the prices uh, using some kind of an exponential uh, mechanism. That turns out to not quite work, but then we observed that uh, in our system, sometimes what happens is the number of offers can be actually 100,000, a million, and so on, but the number of assets is not that large. And generally, in a typical block, the number of asset pairs that are actually being traded is even smaller. It's not like a full n squared. So it turns out that each inner loop of the tetonment, you can make it proportional to the square of the number of assets. And uh, that's what gives us the computational tractability in practice. Uh, the other thing that gives us computation tractability in practice is what we do is uh, we don't insist on tetonment doing, giving us really good results. We terminate it like fairly soon. We terminate it even when it's roughly, uh, uh, when it hasn't quite converged. Uh, we don't insist on very good convergence because uh, what we can do is we can, uh, uh, we can write a linear program to clean up the results of the tetonment. So the tetonment comes up with some prices. These are not, these are not converged prices. But the market still needs to have some consistency requirements, right? It still has to clear correctly, right? You still have to sort of uh, respect the prices that you post. So what you can do is you can have a linear program where uh, uh, the prices P and the maximum surplus epsilon are given as parameters. The surplus is the amount of money that the maximum, you're not allowed to generate a deficit, but maybe you can generate a small surplus. Okay? And then for every pair of assets A and B, you pre-compute a lower bound L and an upper bound U on the amount of trade between these assets. So you can say, well, anything which is within 10% of the price that I'm declaring, I have to absolutely match. Anything which is worse than the price, I cannot match because of voluntary participation. And so that gives you like a set that you have to match, which is the lower bound set, and the set that you might match is the upper bound set. We write an LP to find the most number of transactions you can do while they may, or generate the minimum surplus while respecting all this. And as it turns out, that after, all the, after we did all the software optimizations, this LP, the simple LP, ends up being the computational bottleneck. And uh, 
the tournament setup is not a computational bottleneck with the, the current data set, but of course if we get into a regime where the number of offers is and the number of assets is the same, then uh, tournament would become the computational bottleneck. So generally I feel like this is a good direction for some algorithmic engineering. The overall transaction is that we end up supporting uh, end up being quite high. So they are like, uh, for example, uh, with 48 cores, uh, with a lot of cores, uh, you can speed up the process. And uh, this is not the speed up tournament or LP. This is the just, just speed up writing the block. So once you compute the prices, you have to still go and go through every trade, decide whether to execute the trade or not, right? And then once you decide whether to execute the trade, you have to actually compute all the cryptographic hashes and write them onto disk. And that part ends up being a big bottleneck. And that's why the fact that the prices are fixed and the orders within a block commute with each other ends up being useful because you can parallelize it. So with, as the number of cores increases, we can easily handle, uh, uh, we can easily like scale up to the case where like the tens of millions of offers that we are considering currently. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, there are like hundreds of assets and we can get transaction rates of like in the hundreds of thousands which uh, for those of you who know uh, blockchains, like Bitcoin might give you like a transaction every few seconds or something. Okay. So uh, this is just a mapping of like a real system problem to an algorithm engineering problem, which I think uh, turns out to be meaningful. Uh, several uh, blockchains are trying to implement it, uh, including I think one top 25 blockchain has implemented this exchange and they're trying to figure out, they've implemented it, they're figuring out how to use it. Okay. Um, and so, so basically batch offer matching eliminates internal arbitrage in front running. It's replicable and auditable because, uh, which means that uh, the code is fixed. You can, uh, once the block is fixed, anyone can run it. Uh, you can run it and therefore you can run a blockchain layer one. What that means is you can actually run it on a block. It's faster than you can actually run it on a blockchain. You don't have to run it off chain. Um, The, the next thing uh, is, uh, the next part of the talk is about uh, constant function market makers. But it does connect back to this first part of the talk. If anyone has any questions about the first part, you can ask them now. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons why writing on the chain is difficult is because you have to assemble these blocks sequentially. So you do you cannot figure out whether you write down one transaction on a block, that one transaction might take money from your ledger and into my ledger, and therefore you cannot write down the next transaction in the block till that first transaction has been written and all the values updated. And this is not quite like as simple as in a SQL database. Uh, 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 so just writing, just changing the ledger, just going through all the cryptographic uh, primitives needed to decode the transaction that you and I are doing, access, access our ledger balances, update them temporarily, right? That, that's sort of what makes it very hard uh, to write a block in sequence. Once you know that different trades in, in this block commute with each other. So in the process of assembling the block, you've already verified that there's enough money in your account that you can actually enter the order that you've entered. But then because they commute, the prices don't change, they're stable for the block. Uh, and the arrow debris model, once you have the prices, every offer can individually decide whether they got committed or not. So you can parallelize writing on the blockchain. And because you can parallelize that process, that's how you get uh, the huge improvement. Thanks for answering, uh, for asking, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think there's this, uh, there's this other kind of uh, analysis that you are, uh, I think you are hinting at, which is like the kind of thing that Amin was uh, looking at in his talk, which is like, uh, was the right batch size, uh, was the right stochastic arrival model, was the right pricing model? And this sort of focuses very, very narrowly on the algorithmic implementation, the implementation aspect. I think that, that thing is going to be crucial. Right? And also sort of, but then that, that sort of very quickly gets into the whole complexity of like all of finance, which is how do you how do you estimate future prices? What's your belief? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, it's a library, so as the, as the library can decide, oh, sorry, the LP, uh, the linear program uh, uh, will uh, do, uh, the linear program produces enough information that you get tie breaking. From the linear program, yes. Yes. Yeah, so you do, you solve your tetonment, you solve your linear program, you essentially get the, uh, the, the clearing prices. You get a little bit more than the clearing prices because the linear program just breaks the clearing price semantics a little bit. It might give you like a little bit of a spread. And for things exactly at that spread, it'll tell you which things happen and which things don't happen. Yeah. So there's maybe just right at the boundary, it has to generate a little bit more data than uh, just the prices. Then. Yes, go ahead. I think partly they don't batch in regular trading because uh, they're doing this continuous double auction, which is a huge amount of liquidity. And they have a very deep order book, which is always sitting there, and the, and the spreads are small. In markets where the spreads are large, they, they do batch. Uh, so for example, if you're selling huge amounts of stock uh, and there's nobody who's willing to buy it, they might look, there's these dark pools which will collect all your big batches of stock trades and uh, batch them. But, but once again, Salah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't, I'm not a blockchain expert. I'm, honestly, I don't even, I'm not even sure I believe in uh, blockchains all that much. Right? But this, uh, this is just like this, whether we end up doing this digital currencies on the blockchain or whether we end up doing some other way, digital currencies are definitely here to stay. Right? They're going to definitely happen. And there are going to be many of them, right? whether you're doing a centralized ledger or a blockchain. So the blockchain part is only relevant to this, uh, this outside stuff, right? Like how do you do a blog proposal? How do you do a consensus? How do you write it? This inside problem is, is, is uh, here to stay. It's definitely here. And so, and it's uh, despite what you might think from like many polynomial time algorithms that we've seen in the stock and Fox, it's not quite solved. So the next thing is uh, constant function market makers. Okay? Uh, it's a very exciting uh, decentralized finance prim primitive. The, the, the primitive is quite old. Uh, uh, I mean, not in DeFi because DeFi is new, but uh, in general, this idea of market makers is old, but the name is new. It's from uh, Angelis and Chitra in 2020. So here you consider a market maker who wants to provide liquidity between two assets A and B that are infrequently traded. I right? say so dollars and go coin. Right? Uh, nobody's really trading go coin, uh, but the market maker still wants to make a market in dollars and go coin. So there's one thing you can do is, uh, yeah. Uh, the name is new, the formulation is new, DeFi itself is new, but there's an equivalence uh, which we just discovered. Uh, I don't think it's published, I don't think we published it, I'm not sure if anybody else published it. But you can think of CFMMs uh, as a variant of a prediction market. So as I describe what a CFM is, you'll, hopefully a lot of you will have like visions of prediction markets. Yeah. And even before that, 30 years ago, there was this notion of automated market makers, which was uh, going back all the way to say Milgram's work uh, 30, 40 years ago, which were not quite constant function, but they were sort of doing some kind of Bayesian uh, updates to make markets. So notion of, notion of automated market makers is definitely not new. Uh, the notion of constant function market makers is new in this guise, but it's actually similar in some ways to prediction markets. No, it's, they've been deployed before. The name is from 2020, but they've been deployed before, sorry. They've been deployed for like at least five years now. Uh, so you consider a market maker who wants to provide liquidity between two assets A and B that are infrequently traded, let's say dollars and go coin. So what can you do, right? You can batch it like I was saying in the previous thing, but maybe the liquidity is not enough to even batch it. You batch it, somebody have to wait for like a few weeks. <clears throat> so what, what the market maker can still do is just put down some initial amounts of each asset into a liquidity pool. So I can put like $1, uh, like $100 and 1,000 Go coins right? uh, into something which I call a liquidity pool, and I specify a liquidity function f of xy. Okay? And then any participant can come and take dollars on this and put Go coin in, or put dollars in and take Go coin out. And all they have to do is to make sure that this liquidity function, uh, liquidity function does not change. Okay? 
and hence the name constant function market maker. Uh, generally, these things are sort of like, they look like this. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so basically, you have to make sure that if x, y was the amount in before the transaction and x prime, y prime after the transaction, then f of x prime, y prime equal to f, f of x, y. Okay, so the liquidity function does not change. Yes? No, the market maker specifies a liquidity function. So that's part of the market. So the market. Yes, implicitly specifying the price. Yes, exactly. So simplifying, implicitly specifying a price because the price, because the liquidity curve is a, is a constant, is a function of the constant, that means X and Y can only trade on this curve, and the derivative of that curve will implicitly give you the price. Yes. Uh, initial price. The price will change as you move along the curve. So the market maker is putting, the market is doing just exactly this. It's putting some initial amounts of assets, X and Y, and specifying the function. Okay. And whatever that function happens to be for the current X and Y, it has to remain there. There's often a transaction fee that we'll ignore. I'm gonna assume that this is quasi-concave, continuous, and differentiable, this liquidity function. Quasi-concave just means that it looks convex. If you draw it like it looks convex. Um, so here's an example. Uh, Uniswap is a popular uh, CFMM protocol. It's generated over $1 trillion in trades. It's just incredible what uh, these people have been up to. Uh, a simplified view of Uniswap uh, is uh, there's a liquidity function is just xy. So it's a product rule. x times y is a constant. As one asset decreases, this price increases. Okay. So you can compute instantaneous prices. For example, implicit in this curve is that the price from b to a is uh, minus dx over dy, which is c over y squared. So as you can see, as the amount of y decreases, the price from x to y, which is the price of y, will like hugely increase, right? And so the hope is that uh, if you, if the market makers sort of guess the reasonable price at the beginning by putting down the right amounts of x and y, if there's a small amount of market fluctuation, the market will quickly adjust. And so that gives people the confidence that they can get GoCoin and, uh, into dollars or dollars into GoCoin, and so they, they're happy to have, hold GoCoin briefly because they know they can go and trade here. And the market maker hopefully will not lose so much money because this, this function will quickly adjust. So Uniswap is a bit more complex, but let's assume that this is a simplified view. And the question then is, how can you incorporate CFMMs into multi-asset -ex exchanges along with traditional trading offers? So in the last uh, part of the talk, we had this badge exchange, right? And so now I'm saying that one of the participants, instead of just having offers on the badge exchange, I'm, I'm, I have offers from retail investors. And they also a bunch of CFMMs who have taken the entire trading function and entered it as an order in the multi-asset exchange. Do you still have equilibrium and can you still compute it efficiently? And, and what, what does it even mean? Uh, so I think as it turns out, the, the uh, computational questions here are much harder, but they're not as interesting. And the really interesting question is what does it even mean to add uh, a trading function, like a liquidity function, like fx equal to xy, to an existing exchange, right? What, what offers does it translate into, and what behavior does it result in? So there are these four possible ways you could, uh, I mean, there are many ways, but I'm illustrating four. You could incorporate CFMMs into a batch exchange, or any, uh, into a batch exchange system on an error de market. So uh, one example could be, uh, uh, so, so let's, so, the dotted lines here represent, uh, let's imagine you have run a batch. Again, you have gotten prices out. So you run a batch and you run Arrow de Bru and you've gotten some prices out of Arrow de Bru. And the question is, given these prices that come out of Arrow de Bru, what is the demand response of a, of a CFMM? So if you give a CFMM a bunch of prices, exactly where will it move? Right. So let's assume that these uh, curves, the slope of these curves represent the price of X and Y. Okay. And let's say this blue, this blue curve represents your uh, liquidity function of the CFMM. Okay. So these are the initial reserves, and you can move anywhere you want. Okay. So there are at least like three or four different things you can do. One thing you can do is you keep moving on the liquidity function of the CFMM, which is what the liquidity, or the market maker has specified to begin with. That you have to move along the liquidity function. You keep moving on this existing liquidity function curve till you hit the right slope which is a slope implied by uh, uh, the prices that you get. Okay. 
the other is that you, you start at the current reserve and you keep moving along the line implied by the prices. And at some point, you, because these curves are quasi-concave, at some point you're gonna hit the curve again. And that becomes your final, uh, uh, that, that's the point that the CFM moves to. A third thing could be that you uh, uh, keep moving along this curve, right? And you keep imagining that this xy equal to three has now become xy equal to four, has now become xy equal to five. And you find the right C such that the same liquidity function with a larger constant value, like the same curve shifted up, uh, now has the right uh, uh, derivative. So basically, you, you try to find you, you try to move this liquidity curve as far up as possible, while it still has a tangent uh, with the uh, between the initial reserves and the and the liquidity uh, prices. Okay. Sorry. So yeah, I mean it's a hard concern in the sense that the market maker doesn't want to have less. But presumably, if the market maker uh, gets more in the pool, if someone wants to both come in and put both a dollar and a go coin in the pool, the market maker will say, okay, fine. So you're reinterpreting the market maker's constraint as saying that the liquidity function cannot go down. As well as saying it must go, must remain exactly the same, but reinterpreting it cannot go down. And was it also your question? Yeah. So, I mean, it's not, it's generally not clear what the right behavior is, right? It's not even clear how you would think of the right behavior. And this is a problem you have to solve before you go to the computation problem of finding the clearing prices. Because the way you would find clearing prices, you would come up with a set of prices. You look at the response of this uh, curve, then you'll know whether you have access or deficit of goods, and then you'll go and readjust the prices. For example, you're willing to torment, right? So you need to know this demand, uh, this trading rule. Yeah, sorry, sir. The first, the first is trade along the liquidity curve till the exchange rates are equalized. The second is trade along the linear batch exchange rate till the liquidity curve is attached. Is, I mean, I don't expect to remember A, B, C, and D, just like the fact that there are three or four different ways of doing it. Yes? So, my initial worry was if you don't get the function right, then like, you know, but this seems like as long as- No, no, sir, that's your, there are many, many worries. I mean, the first worry is do we even need blockchains? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Given the framework. <laughs> The, yeah, the second worry is, do I get the right liquidity function? Yeah, and then yeah. So you're like, this seems like the, it's fine the, if you don't get the right function. No, I mean, there's, there's a separate, it's a, it's a separate open problem, but it has a bigger issue, is what, how do you design the right liquidity function? And I freely admit that's a bigger problem. So, so, so here we are assuming the liquidity function is given to you, and trying to design the liquidity function first principles would be like a, would be a huge, uh, interesting direction. So here are some axioms that you could imagine uh, imposing on the system. You could say voluntary participation. You could say a uh, constant function market maker except trace from reserves x to x prime. And here I'm now thinking of these reserves as being vectors, not just a single number. Because you can also have like multi, um, t three asset, four asset, five asset CFMs. If and only if fx is less than equal to f of x prime, right? So you can say it can go up but cannot go down. Okay. Then you can say uh, full specification. A CFM trading rule, for example, the final point where you end up with, must be completely specified by the initial reserves, the liquidity function, and the batch valuations. So if I give you a CFM, CFM basically is a liquidity function and a, and a reserve, and the, and the, and the error blue market is producing these batch valuations. So what I'm saying is there should be like a demand response curve. It's just like giving these values, you should be able to tell me, uh, CFM should be able to tell me where it's gonna to move to. There's no inter internal arbitrage among multiple CFMs participating in the batch exchange. So wherever, whatever point you leave these, once you're done with this batch exchange, the whole process, wherever these CFMs are left with, if there's CFM between A and B, between B and C and C and A, there shouldn't be no arbitrage between these three pairs. And the spot prices of each CFM, which is the derivative after the trades, of the trade should be the same as the batch valuations. Okay. This fourth thing you can weaken, you can say it's not in, you can derive it as a consequence of the other axioms if you really want in the mild assumption. Okay. And then what you can show is this, these things, which is, uh, you, the C and D, which are basically the same thing, are turn out to be the only uh, de possible demand curve which satisfies these axioms, which is that you trade at the linear batch exchange rate till the exchange rates are equalized, right? So you start trading at this rate till you get to a point on the translated liquidity function. 
such that these uh, spot price on the, the derivative of the liquidity curve and the price is the same. Or alternately, you can say you trade at the batch exchange rate uh, that maximizes the C C CFM liquidity function L. And these two end up being sort of uh, equivalent and they end up being the demand curve. Now that you have the demand curve, now you can feasibly go and ask the question of uh, how do I compute equilibrium, does it exist? And there again, the, the results turn out to be hard to prove, but yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I think it loses out, the, it seems counterintuitive, but it rules out the no arbitrage uh, assumption. And I think what can happen is uh, you can have different forms of the curve and they leave you in some kind of inconsistency. I have to go back and see. It's possible it does not rule out any one axiom. Rules out like a collection of axioms that ha need to happen at the same time. Okay. So the equilibrium computation, I'm out of time. Uh, but the equilibrium computation uh, uh, questions are now like well formed now that you have the demand curve. Uh, given a set of cell offers and CFMs, compute prices such that when each CFM uses trading rule, and each offer that's consistent with the prices is fulfilled, the market clears. There's no deficit or excess left of any good, right? Or if there's any uh, excess left, it goes to basically this, the, the um, sorry, the CFM curve might move up, but there's no excess or deficit of any good. Yeah. Existence and computation are both guaranteed when the trading rule of a CFMM satisfies what's called the weak uh, growth subsidiary con condition. In this case, you can get an explicit uh, convex program along the lines of uh, uh, Devanur et al., but it's like far more complex in this case because you have these functions inside uh, uh, the, uh, the convex program. And it works for Uniswap because Uniswap is actually WGS and everything works nicely for Uniswap, uh, the, which is a liquidity function is constant. And then you can, there's a small theorem that you can prove that the trading rule for a two asset CFMM satisfies WGS uh, if the underlying trading function F is budget invariant and quasi-concave. And budget invariant basically means that if I double all my assets, my spot price remains the same. Um, open problems, uh, fast algorithms for equilibrium computation. Uh, currently it's like order n to the power 10, but like the people here will correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's n to the power 10. Uh, um, it's the n to the power 10. Um, and uh, also, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's, the, that's exactly right. So I think that if they, so this is one example where I think like an actual, uh, people are actually going to, people are going to implement them regardless of whether blockchains happen or not because these digital currencies are proliferating. And so this is like a problem that's worth uh, nailing down. Tetonment is also, I think, coincidentally also around end of the pattern when you work through all the math that they have. Because the, I mean, methods you use about LPs, that might be useful there, right? Okay. So uh, fast solution of the rounding LP, because I was quite surprised, at least with the current parameters, that turns out to be the bottleneck. Uh, an axiomatic understanding of a CFM rule is the best, which is the question that came up uh, earlier. Yeah. And we have some result there, right? And then the one big problem that I haven't uh, uh, touched upon is the adversarial behavior in block assembly. So I pointed out a lot of ways in which these things, I use terms like arbitrage free, uh, 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 no risk free front running and all that. But I don't want to suggest that this is like uh, somehow uh, a foolproof system because I'm assuming that there's a block proposal phase where somebody is assembling the order book. And a lot of hanky-panky happens in this assembly of the order book because these are, this is being assembled by these miners and people who are close to the sort of uh, mining. So just say, assume the arrow debris framework and just say, suppose the order assembly is adversarial. How can you counter the order assembly being adversarial? I think that would be like a big conceptual uh, contribution to this area. And then of course, uh, the one thing I would like to point out is that uh, uh, I, I somehow feel like these, the problems that we're discussing in DeFi, they are well motivated. Okay? And they're well motivated independent of blockchains. And there's some aspects of these problems that are very blockchain related, uh, but not all of them. And I somehow feel like these things like multi-asset exchanges, uh, CFMs, they're going, to have a, they're going to have a longer shelf life than uh, Ethereum or Bitcoin. That, that, that's what I personally feel. Yeah. Thank you. The quasi-concavity uh, condition on F yeah. is that 
natural i mean i know that it's that very prevalent in the yeah. okay without that a lot of things break down i know but so we, like if, in practice uh, natural so everything that we have found is cause icon not everything not everything that has been suggested has uh, is uh, weakly go substitutable so wgs but we have found examples which are not wgs okay uh, but uh, cause icon i think cause icon concavity just follows because uh, if you make a trade uh, uh, you, you it, it must be uh, it must be sort of uh, better to make quasi concavity basically says that uh, upper level sets are convex um, i mean these are not utility functions so this is quasi so i th i think what you're saying is your intuition is exactly right quasi concavity of the liquidity function will translate into concavity or something similar for uh, Uh, the utility function. So what's quasi concave here is the is the liquidity function f of x y equal to constant. Uh, the LP is uh, uh, maybe hundred uh, thousand. Uh, yeah, let's say let's say of uh, size uh, m squ n squared, where n squared is the number of assets, and then. Uh, uh, So, so now is the is the number of asset pairs? Asset pair. Yeah. The thing is, whatever you have to do with this number of asset pairs and tautonment, the, the inner loop is the number of asset pairs, but the number of iterations that tautonment takes, especially because we are relying so heavily on the LP to clean up any mistakes that tautonment made, the tautonment actually ends up taking less time than the LP solution. Ten thousand variables. Ten thousand variables. Yes. And the numbers, we we want a solution. Sorry. Uh, no, no, it doesn't doesn't matter. I mean, I, it's hard to think of something that would not give basic feasible solutions. But yeah, no, I think uh, yeah. So I think just if there's if someone can identify special structure in this LP, which makes it much easier to solve, or even better, special structure in the original convex program, which makes that because like you said, there are only like two non-zero uh, values for each uh, uh, agent, uh, which makes that easier to solve. Uh, uh, And, and then once once you have the basic problem, then there are all these all these problems that Amin was mentioning are also important, right? Like you have these leftover orders. Can you somehow use information from the previous unmatched leftover orders to determine quickly what happens to the next thing? Uh, can you speed it up the computation of if you have some stochastic assumptions in the input? So I feel like once you solve the basic problem, this all these problems become interesting. And uh, at the risk of repeating myself, I think it's going to be a is going to be a consequential problem. So the utility function is always on two variables, right? Two assets. Yes. So maybe. I mean, in the simple. Sorry, you can have multi. You can have complex assets, and the theory goes through. But practically, if you you just assume two assets. One can design a better algorithm for, like this looks like a very special case. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.